Nikki, should I start? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We're all, yep, we're all ready. Take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm just closer. <laughs> I'm Courtney Fur, the Non Human Rights Projects Director of Government Relations and Campaigns, and I'm so excited to have two um, very important people joining us today to talk about a historic initiative that's happening in um, a canton in Switzerland, and it will be uh, a citizens' initiative to. Uh, uh, recognize and protect the rights of non-human primates. And joining us today um, is legal scholar Charlotte Blattner and uh, Sentient Managing Director Silvano, Silvano Leaguer. Um, and they're going to talk about the initiative, um, the political system in Switzerland, and uh, the very uh, interesting legal uh, uh, sort of battle that took place to get this to where it is. Um, so I'll turn it over to Silvano to talk about the work his organization is doing in this initiative. Thank you so much, Courtney, for the nice introduction. And thank you so much to everyone joining. I'm, uh, you know, flattered. Many people turned up. That's great. Um, I prepared some slides. We're gonna try to share those. I hope you can see them now. Exactly, so I'm quickly, I'm actually not gonna be uh, talking too much about the initiative. I'm gonna leave that to Charlotte, um, but it's gonna give a quick introduction to who we are, our organization, Sentience, and uh, as well as very brief overview on the political system in Switzerland that we're working with. Um, exactly, so who are we? Sentience is an organization that focuses on, on three main topics. That's agriculture, consumption, and animal dignity. And because of the last one, we are also doing an initiative like the one we're going to talk about today uh, on basic rights for primates. Um, we do use initiatives very specifically as a tool. I'm going to talk about later um, exactly like what kind of initiative we're talking about. Um, we do a lot of policy work. So we work directly with parliamentarians. We help them with uh, by writing motions for them, by doing research for them. Um, as well as we do education. So we have uh, like podium discussions or different events or out of home advertising on different topics. Um, but we have a very strong focus on politics. So our core is politics. Um, our organization is rooted deeply in with the, like the principles of effective altruism. So our projects always take the scope of a problem um, into consideration. Tractability, is it possible to see like a measured impact that we're gonna have as well as neglectedness. This is a topic that not many people are working on um, in the sphere of animal rights, animal welfare, then it's something for us. Uh, we were founded in 2014 with an independent organization uh, for uh, since 2017. So a little later, we were a project before by the Effective Altruism uh, Foundation. Uh, we're now a team of 10 people. So we've constantly grown, uh, which is very nice to see. There's a need for, for this kind of work in Switzerland. Um, and we are focused on Switzerland. So we really try to use direct democracy in Switzerland to achieve a change uh, for non-human animals. And exactly, so direct democracy, um, just very briefly. So direct democracy, it's people decide on policies without intermediaries or representatives. So Switzerland is not in that sense, a direct democracy that we decide about everything, that everyone is asked about everything, of course not. Um, so we're a so-called semi-direct democracy. So we do have parliament, we do have um, different chambers, uh, as well as you know the government, of course. So, um, but we have many um, strong instruments of direct democracy. So many things, four times a year, uh, every citizen in Switzerland receives an envelope and there are, and this kind of um, is in the bottom here of this slide on, on the municipal level, cantonal level and federal level. So you receive an envelope with different um, things that you are able to decide on and that could be national it could so on federal level that could be on the cantonal level which is kind of like a, a state level i want to say so we have 26 states in switzerland even even though we're a small country and a uh, municipal level so there you can you can make decisions based on that so basically it's always a question of yes or no do i want to accept this referendum this initiative for change yes or no um and the initiative um also known as popular initiative or citizens initiative as it was uh, written in the name of this particular uh, call today. Um, yeah, 
basically people sign that they want a certain amendment uh, and they give their name, their signature, and that can be on a municipal level, on a cantonal level, or on a federal level. And today, this initiative in particular is on a cantonal level. Um, and we, we talking about the direct initiative. This is our tool. So the changes are not in legislature, but, in, but they are on the constitution. So we're trying to change the constitution with the initiative that we're talking about today. Um, and there are different needs for that. So when we're talking national in Switzerland, you would have to gather 100,000 signatures. So that's quite a, quite a lot of work. And in, uh, on a cantonal level, it, it varies widely. So states are very different. They have very different rules. Uh, sometimes there are cities that require more signatures than some states and so some cantons in Switzerland. And Basel has a quite low number, I want to say. So you need to get 3,000 signatures and then you kind of force a vote on the matter uh, throughout the canton. So every, every um, member of the electorate will be able to vote on your proposal. Even though we struggled to get it to a vote, but Charles is going to talk about that a little later. Um, and then the question is, why did we choose Basel? So first of all, um, and there's two reasons that are very clear, like Basel is a hub for, for pharma in Switzerland. So there, is, um, there are very big uh, pharma, pharmaceutical companies like Roche and Novartis, that might even be known in the US, um, that have their headquarters in Basel, as well as a very big zoo. I think it's the second largest zoo in the country. And that also has primates. And there's two, actually, there's two zoos that have primates. Also, Basel is a city canton, so it's a city and also a canton, um, which makes it quite progressive because you don't have all of the, the countryside that usually also votes and votes generally more conservative. So it's also strategically interesting for us to kind of push uh, ideas that are rather progressive uh, in, a, in a setting like that. And that's more or less the overview. I haven't gone into detail into what we're actually proposing, and I think I'm going to leave that uh, to Charlotte to, to explain. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for giving us that overview. Um, and I guess um, I'll now direct my questions to Charlotte, who was instrumental in drafting this initiative, as well as helping with the legal dispute that we'll go over. It was a three year long legal dispute that went up all the way to the Swiss Supreme Court. Um, so first off, um, if you could go over what the current state of animal welfare and animal rights law are in Switzerland. I'm sure many people on this call know that Switzerland is very progressive with animal welfare uh, laws and policies. So if you wouldn't mind going over sort of the current status of those in Switzerland. Thank you so much, Courtney, for having us um, speak about this urgent matter today, also to the US audience and global audience as well. Um, I'm, I'm more than thrilled to be, um, first of all, talking about some of the um, idiosyncrasies of this case and how it operated, but also what it means for global movement for animal rights. And I think it's more than time for us to have a discussion about this because um, if it succeeds, and even up until this point, having a Supreme Court decision um, ruling that we get to vote on whether um, other animals deserve basic rights as well. This is historical. It's, it's never happened before. It's unprecedented. So all the more it's important for us to be talking about this today. And I'm thrilled to see so many people join us today. So um, yeah, um, what we've tried to secure with the initiative is to have animals recognized as bearers of rights. So bearers of in, in individual and actionable rights. This is structurally completely different from the state of animal law that we currently have in Switzerland. So as you mentioned, Courtney, um, lots of people here in the room today have probably in some form or another heard about Switzerland as a pioneer or at least a country being very progressive when it comes to protecting animals. So just to mention a few of those achievements that I think are, we're internationally renowned for, for example, is that we recognize animals as sentient beings. We explicitly declare that they're not legal beings and we were one of the first countries to do so, um, aside from Germany and Austria. We're also one of the first countries to actually ban battery caging that was done in 1992. And in the same year, we have enshrined in our federal constitution, the duty to protect animals dignity. 
um, something that made the headlines more recently in 2018, we've banned um, boiling lobsters alive because we've recognized that they have uh, sentience as well. So it's not legal to do this anymore. And if you want to believe the World Animal Protection Index, we're manifestly one of the most progressive countries when it comes to protecting animals. So all in all, all of this sounds quite promising, right? However, when we look at the lived reality that animals face, none of this looks very different from what other animals are going through in other countries. So despite banning battery cages, for example, we have still a large reality of factory farming in Switzerland that is totally legal. And we have lobsters that still end up in the cooking pot and they're just, you know, killed by more crude methods like electroshocks or me mechanical destruction of the brain and so on. And although we have a Swiss civil code that recognizes that animals are not legal objects, it also states that if no special rules apply, they are subject to the provisions that govern legal objects. So all of these things come with a certain caveat, as you see. And as anywhere else in the world, in Switzerland too, animals, including primates, can be institutionally and on a large scale be bred, raised, used and killed in relatively unhindered manner. The act also still allows um, invasive experiment, painful invasive, invasive experiments done on animals. In fact, um, if we follow the statistics, this number of especially the most painful experiments done on animals is rising. And all of this is in place despite rather, say, grandiose statements such as we protect the dignity of animals. And so we have clearly an Animal Welfare Act that unlike other acts such as the federal U.S. Animal Welfare Act does in fact recognize animals' interests prima facie, but it it tends to subordinate those interests to the interests of humans in a quite a structural manner. So for example, economic interests that we have, regardless of how minor or negligible they may be, they're usually considered to be more important than animals' even most fundamental interests, like the interest to be alive, the interest not to be physically harmed and so on. And this is because the law is based on the premise that animals are here to be used for us. So this is a so-called use or welfare paradigm that still structures much of Swiss animal laws. And it's actually made clear in one of the guiding principles of the Swiss Animal Welfare Act, and it states, and I quote, anyone who handles animals has to ensure their well-being as far as the intended purpose allows, unquote. So you see that the Per they have a purpose and of course that purpose is not defined by them but it's defined by us and for us usually and only insofar as that purpose leaves room to protect animals which is usually marginal do we need to protect them and I think that's a clear enough statement about where we're at with the state of animal law in Switzerland. Yeah and, and that um, what you, you put it so eloquently <laughs> and really um, gave a great overview um, of what's going on in Switzerland. And I think really highlights something that we like to say in terms of why we're doing the work that we're doing is that while animal welfare laws are incredibly important, especially for highlighting issues that are facing animals, they still prioritize the interests of humans over the interests of animals. Whereas animal rights really prioritizes the interests of the animal above all else um, or the non-human animal above all else. And that's really the key difference between welfare and rights and why it's needed. Um, so maybe we can go a little bit into what this initiative will actually ask for. I know Silvano uh, talked a little bit about how it will, it seeks to um, recognize and protect the bodily liberty and integrity and mental um, well-being of non-human primates. But I know you were a primary drafter of this initiative. So if you could talk a little bit about what um, is actually in it and, and the practical implications of it. Um, if it were to be enacted or um, not enacted, uh, passed <laughs> by the, the residents of, of Basel. Um, yeah, I'd love to do that. Maybe um, 
uh, if I if I can, I'd love to unpack that a bit more. Um, I'm not sure if all of the people present here understand why. So we've talked about the shortcomings of the Animal Welfare Act, right? But uh, we've not yet made the case for why rights are, re- are necessary. We could say, well, we have rights, and so it seems necessary that animals have them too, and so we have an equal status, right? That seems intuitive, but maybe if you um, allow me to, I'd, I'd go a bit more into detail as to what why rights would be needed in the first place, because that's the core of what the initiative asks for. Of course, go, go for it. (laughs) So, so what's different about rights from the animal welfare acts that we typically see is first of all, really the most basic and fundamental interests of animals would be recognized as such. The interest in being alive, that there's no animal welfare act in the world that recognizes that, except for the Turkish one, I actually saw a provision in there, but I'm I'm not quite sure to what extent that is um, being, being uh, lived up to in reality. So most animal welfare acts don't actually recognize animals' interest in being alive. And so rights would recognize that. And um, the rights that we typically ask for as well is the right to bodily and physical, so bodily physical integrity, but also mental integrity, because that's a um, that's that's very closely related to physical integrity, and it's also shown from bi- biological and welfare side that this is really important to animals' well overall well being. So these interests would be protected through rights, and those are mostly negative rights, or it's also called immunity rights. So it's not a claim right to get the state to act in a certain way. Those rights would also be possible. But prima facie is just a right to be left alone, that just a right for others not to infringe on your most fundamental interests. And as rights bearers, animals would qualify as legal persons. So they would have an individual legal position, not like a broad abstract public interest in protecting animals, but in the, an individual legal position as a legal subject. And as such, this guarantees that these rights are enforceable and actionable as well. If you're rights holders, um, there's a, a very basic acknowledgement that you cannot lawfully be instrumentalized for someone else's purpose. We recognize that when it comes to uh, principles governing human uh, research with human subjects, for example, it's very, very different sets of rules that apply to those subject as opposed to animal subjects, for example. If you're recognized as a rights holder, there's also a much more strict balancing of interest test that applies, as in the case where human rights are infringed. So if you then want to infringe on a primate's most basic right, you would have to have a legal basis, a sufficient legal basis to do that. This infringement would have to be based on a legitimate public interest, and it would have to be proportionate to the primates affected interest. And so there's a quite an elaborate proportionality analysis, and I will not go into detail to that. We can talk about this later, maybe in the Q&A if someone's interested, but just to know that the balance of interest test is much more egalitarian than what we see today being done um, under the umbrella of the Animal Welfare Act. Fundamental rights also have a so-called core content. And this is an area of the right that may not be infringed under any circumstances, regardless of what interests and how important they could be, um, they cannot be infringed. And so in our case, that's usually the prohibition of torture um, in the European tradition, also the prohibition of targeted killing. And it's of course, Um, we can consider the same case or an analogous position to be established for primates as well. And so that's structurally very, very different from what we see is um, being done on the Animal Welfare Act. And so in this manner, um, the uh, Sentience Politics has actually launched the initiative on the cantonal level for everyone, um, maybe just to give a a brief... um, overview over that. We have 26 cantons in Switzerland. Canton is like a state in a sense, and we've done that in one single state. And it's not just that there's a lower threshold to overcome to be successful with an initiative if you do this on a cantonal level. Another advantage of having an initiative be done on the cantonal level is that Cantons have historically in Switzerland always operated as so-called laboratories of direct democracy. 
So they've played a key role in pioneering social, social political change, as in the case of introducing voting rights for women, for example. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of rights that Canton's first introduced and that then have made it to the federal level. This is why, why it's so important to do this, to start this initiative in one Canton and see if it's being accepted, how it operates in practice, and then elevate it to the federal level. So the initiative asks citizens to vote on amending the cantonal constitution. There's an article in the constitution, a whole uh, range of basic rights that are being guaranteed, such as humans' right to life, their bodily and mental integrity, freedom from torture, right to autonomy and security, a ban on forced labor and human trafficking. And the initiative asked for um, a new addendum to this provision, and it would read as follows, and I quote again, this constitution guarantees, among others, the right of non-human primates to life and bodily and mental integrity. So as you see, it's embedded in the basic rights catalog of the constitution. It's not somewhere at the far end of the constitution. It's in Article 11. So this is a core uh, provision in the constitutional rights catalog. That's amazing. <laughs> um, it's like so, so fantastic that this has reached the point where it's being able to be voted on by um, the citizens of Basel. And I know it's been a struggle um, or a, a journey to get to this point. Um, the initiative was introduced by said in 2016 um, and then a three year legal battle or legal dispute ensued um, going up to the Swiss the federal Supreme Court. Um, um, if you, and I know um, along the way, there were some really great rulings um, talking about how um, non-human primates, um, you know, could be within the circle of rights holders. So if you could talk a, a bit about that legal dispute and any key, um, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> decisions that were made by the courts along the way, that would be really uh, fantastic. Sure, I'd love to. If I uh, would you just stop me or give me a reminder if I if I go too much into detail because I've worked on this for such a long time. Yeah. And I, I just, but I don't want to bore anyone. No, so, I think it's it's fascinating, and I know that there were some really great um, decisions and and really just quotes that came out from from the legal dispute at all the levels throughout it. Um, so feel free to talk. <laughs> Yeah, I'd actually love to, because I also think that in the strategy that we had and the, uh, you could term it more or less peculiar way in which the courts responded to that, there's a lot to be taken for lawyers in other jurisdictions as to, because, you know, you can argue one way or another as a lawyer, whether the court is going to buy into it and how they're going to do that is a different way. And they might come to the same conclusion as you would have wished for, but the journey to that is way different. And that may itself um, come as an obstacle for future cases. So it's going to be interesting. And uh, you just stop me if I go too much into detail. So um, as Silvano mentioned, it's actually, the, I mean, getting together 3,000 signatures in the, that's a necessary requirement basically to get uh, an initiative to be voted on by the people. So it's not a huge threshold. And um, as far as I'm informed, they got together the necessary signatures in quite a short period of time. And so all of that, that was a, a fantastic start from the get go. But then the initiative came to a halt when the Grand Council of the Canton of Basel, which is basically the parliament of the canton declared the initiative inv invalid. And there's a way in which you can declare the initiative invalid among others, if it violates as they claimed federal law. And that itself became the subject of a three year long legal dispute. You can imagine um, the agenda of Silvano and the people at Sentient, po Sentient Politics coming um, turning out very different from what they had anticipated as a consequence of that. So um, the Grand Council of Basel argued that the initiative violates federal law and it argued that it did so in two um, important respects. First, it said it violates federal 
civil law, so the federal civil code. This code, they argued, exhaustively determines who qualifies as a legal person. And because it does so in an exhaustive manner, there, there's no room to actually establish legal personhood for animals on the cantonal level. So in the code, we have two provisions. Um, one is um, one establishes legal personhood for natural persons, and the other establishes legal personhood for legal persons. And so it just said, so because this act doesn't give room for animal personhood, there's no way that you could do this on the cantonal level. And the second way in which they said that the initiative violates federal law is that it violates Article 80 of the Constitution. And this article states that the uh, Confederation shall legislate on the protection of animals, while the cantons are responsible for the enforcement of the regulations. And it said um, that the federal government has exhaustive and exclusive competence to protect animals, and thereby there's no room left for the cantons as well. And so uh, prima facie, especially if you're not, um, I don't know, if you're maybe not super convinced by animal rights and you don't know much about Swiss law, you're like, that sounds quite convincing. Um, now listen to our argumentation, which I think was actually quite which actually actually quite creative and obviously made sense to the courts in some sense as well. So we said that the definition of legal personhood in the civil code does not apply to public law matters, such as what we're dealing with in this case. The civil code distinctively applies to legal relations between private parties. But what we have here is legal personhood for the purpose of establishing basic rights. And this is a genuinely public or constitutional matter because it pertains to the relationship between the government and individuals, so between primates and public bodies. So in this public law context, cantons are in fact free to establish legal personhood for any type of entity, including primates. We also did recognize that Article 80 of the Constitution gives the federal government broad legislative competence in all matters of animal protection, such as the keeping and care of animals, experiments on animals, procedures carried out on living animals, the use of animals, their killing, and so on. Um, but this federal competence of the government in these areas is primarily focused on making animals and their bodies accessible for humans. So they prescribe how animals can be kept, bred, used, traded, killed, and so on. Um, it's not actually about protecting animals. So such a stance is based on the paradigm of necessity or use paradigm. And as I argued before, it's conceptually much different from establishing legal rights for animals that actually seek to secure their most basic interests. And another critical argument that we've made um, at the Constitutional Court where we appealed the decision of the Grand Council was that citizens must be allowed to vote on an initiative when there is doubt about its legality. We call this principle in dubio pro populo, in doubt for the people. And so this principle applies whenever there is some, you know, gray zone as to is this still legal or not? If you're kind of insecure about it, you should definitely put it to the vote of the people. That's a, a basic principle that was working in our favor. And so we have achieved in 2019 a groundbreaking decision by the first court ruling on the matter that was the Constitutional Constitutional Court of Baselstadt, so on the cantonal level. The court ruled that the initiative was legally valid and that the citizens should be allowed to vote on the question of whether, and as he rightly said, the court says, whether to expand the circle of rights holders beyond the anthropological barrier. And the Constitutional Court agreed with us on the argumentation regarding federal competency in civil law matters. We did not violate that. And it did, uh, so it did in that sense secu secure our argumentation that in when it comes to public law matters, legal personhood can be established by cantons. There's a way to do that. What it did not accept was the fundamental difference between welfare protection and fundamental rights, because it said that such a distinction conflates ends with means. 
Um, so it said the initiative seeks to better protect primates and it uses the instrument of fundamental rights to achieve this aim. So rights are not categorically different from welfare protections. They're just a means to achieve better welfare for animals. And as a consequence of that, it said the initiative, if it became law at some point, would conflict with federal law only if it were to force private people, private individuals, private parties to observe stricter standards than those enshrined in the Animal Welfare Act. So it would not, as a consequence, be permissible, for example, to um, hold the Basel Zoo, which is a private company, um, um, responsible for observing strictures, stricter standards for these animals. But all in all, the court said that the initiative is valid and the Animal Welfare Act does not prevent cantons from imposing on their own authorities stricter standards than those imposed federally on private individuals. Uh, I hope this distinction makes sense right now. So it's on its own organs. The canton can um, basically um, hold them um, accountable to, to observe stricter rights as a means to secure the welfare, but that's not possible when it comes to private individuals. Um, to our surprise, there were six members of the Ground Council that appealed this decision as, at the Swiss Federal Supreme Court. Um, and that ruling was delivered in September last year. So the court largely affirmed, the federal Supreme Court largely affirmed the reasoning of the Cantonal Constitutional Court and upheld that the initiative was legally valid and must be put to a vote by the people. It held that the narrow understanding of legal, legal subjecthood in the context of civil or private law is not applicable and does not prevent the canton from extending fundamental rights to beings other than humans. It's also interesting that it did not say that establishing legal personhood before conferring rights on them would be um, a premise that needs to be fulfilled beforehand. Also a very interesting point that we can talk about later. So in a sense, um, the court basically invited us all as, as a public to more critically assess existing animal welfare law. It's something we discuss on a public level right now as Sentience Politics um, does its campaign works um, with a view to the upcoming vote. Um, but it did also agree with the lower court that the initiative would not, at least not directly, affect private parties. So. Uh, a chimpanzee in a private zoo could still be killed, could still be in cage, could, et cetera, right? Only if the canton itself had a zoo or runs research, et cetera, would these rights come to application. So all in all, still a very historical ruling by the federal Supreme Court to the extent that we still have the first direct democratic vote in the world on whether at least some non-human animals should also be afforded fundamental rights, even if that's narrowed down with respect to the breadth of that initiative. Oh, and maybe what I should mention as well is really interesting that the court agreed that this shouldn't be a decision that should be made by public authorities, but this is ultimately a matter that the people should decide on. I think that's a very important aspect as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this whole case is, my on mute, is really <laughs> um, interesting. And um, especially the lower courts um, sort of, uh, agreeing that the, the circle of rights holders should extend beyond humans and can be inclusive of non-human animals. Um, and I think that's really great. And it's something that we frequently argue um, in our cases. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just fantastic. Um, were there any risks or pitfalls that you faced in this litigation um, over the past three years? Oh, gosh, what a question. Um, <laughs> yeah, a ton. Like, we were so nervous before the first ruling. We didn't know which way the court would, you know, we, as you guys do in the US, when, when it comes to 
filing a case somewhere, you're like, who is going to be the judge? What side are they on? What's their political side? Are they likely to, how do I need to frame this to make him or her go, you know? And so um, at some point, I think we let go of trying to control the situation and just try to be as convincing as we could in our argumentation. And I think what you mentioned before that, um, you know, I think, What's interesting about the Swiss case is that the court took a really like a theoretical stance at, to look at the situation. It's like, is there anything that prevents the canton from doing that if the canton wants to, right? It's not like, do we establish basic rights for animals right now? But if the canton wants to, can it or can it law? Is there anything in the law prohibiting it's people from voting on this manner. And that's a, a totally different thing. And so this is why I think the court was more likely swayed to be like, like theoretically, there's nothing in the way of doing that. Even if there is a longstanding continental European tradition to, to view humans and, and, and anthropocentric concepts alone as being um, able to and worthy of deserving basic rights. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing that this happened. And so, um, yeah, there's a ton of obstacles that we've anticipated. And I think we haven't fully overcome that. Like, what does it mean for securing basic rights for other animals in the future? How are, how is this initiative going to be enforced? And so the, um, constitutional court's decision is actually really interesting also in this regard because it had a whole section talking about how these rights could be enforced and that in of itself shows that the court didn't just consider this a theoretical case to I don't know pierce the wall and have some animals be considered as rights holders but it actually did think about what this what does this mean in the future for these animals? So it talked about the possibility. First, it said they need some way of actually enforcing these rights. That's very important acknowledgement, I think. Then they said, well, this could be done by having an ombudsman, for example, or to have um, designated lawyers for primates as well to observe and enforce those interests. And so it's really interesting because lots of people, and I think Silvano can talk about this some more um, in the Q&A as well. Lots of people are like, How, what does this mean in practice? How is this going to be enforced? And I think some people consider this a weakness of the initiative. And um, I'm always a bit... I don't know, concerned hearing that because I'm like, this is exactly the trump of rights. It's exactly what makes rights right. They're general, they're applicable in a myriad of situations. They have to be made more specific and actionable through the acts of administrative bodies and authorities and the people, um, you know, suing the governments to become more strict or um, to have us as a public discuss about what is actually owed to these primates now that they, if that is going to be the case, not that they have rights. So all of that, what we had after we secured the first human rights, all of this huge body of litigation and case law and precedent and practice, et cetera, all of this still needs to be established. And it would be naive to think that we as initiators could anticipate all of this, one. And second, that we have the authority to determine how this is going to come out. And so with that insecurity comes a lot of, you know, there's a danger, for example, that these rights are going to be understood differently from human rights because it's a different category of rights, for example. And so, um, yeah, there's lots of pitfall, pitfalls to face in the future, um, but I think nonetheless a fantastic invitation for the public to discuss about what is going on with primates? What do they need? What do we do to them? Um, is what we do currently to them maybe uh, unjust? And how can we do better? And maybe we can also at some point talk about what we, you know, ab all about the historical injustice that we've done to these animals. So, yeah. Yeah, I know um, that's that's a, a struggle that I've been facing or faced um, for a while um, I'm in charge of drafting our, you know, uh, non-human animal rights legislation at both a local state and federal level um, for what we're going to be advocating for once 
um, you know, the time is appropriate. And, you know, we've been working a lot behind the scenes, but really thinking through all the possibilities of how, um, you know, sort of defining what the right is, is the easiest part, but how would you actually enforce it um, and manage it and, and do what is best for the animals um, who are impacted by these rights and those that are currently being exploited and imprisoned um, for, for us in the United States or whatever jurisdiction that we seek to have legislation um, enacted in. And that actually is sort of the easier part with our litigation because with our litigation, we're solely advocating on behalf of our, our clients and we're seeking to have the right to, um, you know, declare legal persons um, who have the right to bodily liberty and, you know, sent to a sanctuary where they can um, enjoy those rights to the fullest extent possible. Um, and so that's interesting that that you've been thinking you, you sort of went the hard way first with the, the initiative. <laughs> um, but it's so progressive and so amazing that it's going to be voted on. And um, it's it's being voted on in February, correct, of next of 2022, or at least that's the that's the plan as of right now. Yeah, one day before Valentine's Day, 13th of February. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I do have a, 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 I have one question before we open it up to, to Q&A and how, you know, if this hopefully passes, um, how would the adoption of this initiative impact, um, do you think, the rest of Switzerland? Um, do you think it would embolden other cantons or um, sentients to seek um, to have similar initiatives um, introduced in, you know, throughout the country um, and how it may impact, you um, the, the animal rights movement globally, um, since this is the first um, initiative of its type. So um, maybe Silvano can later um, talk more about um, how this might affect the animal rights movement in Switzerland and um, um, sort of a political endeavors of a relevant NGOs. Maybe you can talk a bit more about this and I'll, um, I'll head into you know, um, sorry, I need to think sometimes, it takes time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, maybe one thing that is worthy of mentioning is that with this, so not all of this, even if the, the result that we've achieved is, of course, fantastic, unprecedented and, and historic. It's not what, what we've anticipated the whole process um, from the beginning onwards, right? We knew that there could be some legal issues that would be worthy of debating, right? When the Grand Council declared the initiative invalid, we had a large discussion about whether we should um, appeal this decision. And... I've, I just felt like this is a unique opportunity to have a court, force a court to think about this. And I think that was in, of, in and of itself a fantastic thing to do in a sense, because you don't usually get to that point even. And I think that's a, that's a great advantage of the system that we have. Um, I also think, and I mean, there's different ways of evaluating whether initiative is successful or not. You can do so just by um, doing the counts after the vote and be like, we've done it or not. I think that's a bit um, a short-sighted way of evaluating the initiative. So when it comes to securing voting rights for, for women in Switzerland, for example, and paradoxically enough, worldwide, we were in one of the last countries to actually secure voting rights for women. And the Swiss people always pray them, praise themselves for having it done through a substantive direct, direct democratic vote because they feel like this has given it more legitimacy. And yet now we are the first country to have a direct democratic vote on whether animals or some other animals do deserve basic rights as well. And so that's that's going to be interesting. So, but my point was that in the case of securing voting rights for women, that took so, so many initiatives on the cantonal and federal level, political discussions and so on to actually get to the point of when we were able to secure voting rights for women. And all of these initiatives along the way to the final vote that made the 
the switch, I think were just as integral as the final one. And so they're integral because they force us as people to talk about these issues. You know, I, I get to know people who have nothing to do with animals. They never think about animals. And they're like, that's a joke. Are you seriously trying to secure basic rights for primates? And that's an entry point, right? That's an entry point to talk to them about why this is necessary. And once you inform them about what the reality is for primates in Switzerland, such as think about Kalibi, one of the chimpanzees in the Basel Zoo, who was just, he, he was just put down because he was mobbed by other chimpanzees in the same group. And they felt like this is financially too much of a strain to have another uh, separate enclosure for him with friends as well, and then to supervise and make sure it's friendly and peaceful and so on. And so they just put him down. If not for that, I mean, what are basic rights for? And so I think that definitely deserves a discussion, right? And so I hope that in that sense, the initiative does have uh, an impact on how other people in other jurisdictions think about ways to secure basic rights for animals, not just through precedent and case law, but ballot initiatives as well. Um, how to um, get the people to talk and discuss the shortcomings of the existing system and how this could be ameliorated, right? Basic rights could not be the only way to do that. There's many more ways to ameliorate the situation of animals. And so, yeah, I think there's lots to be learned from that. So, I think, yes. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I just, just wanted to say that, um, yeah, so regarding the question you brought forward before, um, maybe just quickly to give some, some context. So, Charlotte is, is the expert on, on law, you know, like I'm personally not a lawyer, so I come much more from the politi uh, political side or from the uh, campaigning angle of it. So, we're very happy to, you know, work with experts like her. Uh, on this matter. Um, as for what will the consequences be of this initiative, uh, if theoretically we succeed um, for sentience, we, we, we simply don't know yet at the moment. So we really wanna, wanna see what happens there. At the moment, the impact we see is, is much bigger than for what you usually see for cantonal initiatives. So just measuring the amount of media attention this case gets, that it gets internationally. Like we're talking now to US audience, it's very uncommon, uh, of course, for a cantonal initiative. Um, as well as, as just uh, the recognition that we see with other animal rights organizations. So we're frequently in contact now with people from, from abroad, uh, other areas from Switzerland as well, to be like, hey, how did you do it? What's your angle exactly? Like, how do you approach this? Is this uh, replicable in my context? Which is a very difficult question, of course, again, because we're just looking at the, at the experience we've had. Uh, it's very difficult to say, can this be replicated easily in other areas or jurisdictions, most often it cannot, but maybe they're like not in this exact way, but it has to be done somehow. Um, and yeah, so it's difficult to say. I think we're just really looking forward to this vote and um, to see how many people can be swayed. We're quite happy actually at the moment, really unexpectedly, um, three, basically three of the most important parties have now officially shared their support for the initiative. So the largest party, the Social Democrats, uh, says they're gonna, they're gonna tell their, um, their voters to say yes, as well as the Green Party and an alternative Green Party as well. Um, so it's it's more than we anticipated already um, and we're quite uh, enthusiastic about this vote coming in. Yeah, yeah. Charlotte. Can I, yeah it's can also, I add, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Courtney, can I add a point about replicability? Because I think it's so much worth discussing. Um, I know the Non-Human Rights Project um, aims to do that as well, right? Get the people worldwide to do um, to secure basic rights for animals. And I remember meeting Steve about 10 years ago when I did the summer school at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. And we talked about ways to secure basic rights for animals in Switzerland. And he looked at our civil, at our civil code and this article 11 that determines legal personhood for natural persons. He looks at it and he's like, or you could just argue that animals are persons as well, right? Because the act says, um, literally says, every person has legal capacity. And it's like, that's so easy. You can just argue that animals are persons, hence they have legal capacity. You know, like, Steve, that's not how our system works. We can't go to the court and judges in our jurisdiction, they don't have the competency to actually interpret law in such an expansive way as you guys do in the US with 
uh, and the common law system. And so that's really interesting that still after launching a ballot initiative, we had a legal dispute of three years that got us to do that. So very paradoxical, but beautiful in a sense. Yeah, and I think just from my perspective, you know, being in the United States, um, this initiative is really helping uh, grow awareness worldwide about the need for non-human animal rights and what that means and what it entails. Um, and if this passes, it will be truly, you know, amazing and historic, obviously, but I think it will be really helpful in passing similar, um, whether it's ballot initiatives, um, legislation, or even just being cited and, you know, support, uh, cited as support and, you know, future case filings, just showing that other countries around the world are beginning to recognize the fundamental rights of non-human animals. So I think, you know, this is such an instrumental um, um, initiative and, you know, regardless of the outcome, it's going to, it's going to have far reaching effects for the animal rights movement. So um, I'm so grateful for the work that, that you both have been doing and all of your supporters. And I'm so uh, hopeful that it will pass. So um, let's open it up to questions. Mickey, I don't know if anyone, I know we had a couple emails, but I don't know if anyone who's on the chat now has submitted some. Yeah, um, we've got a question from Janet. She asked, um, do you foresee expanding your efforts to include other non-human animals such as other zoos and circus animals? Um, I guess that's a question for me. Um, at the moment, we're really um, waiting to see what's going to happen with this initiative. So kind of all of our efforts uh, are going into this. Um, you know, theoretically, it's possible. I think we have to see what is what is politically feasible. So we really work with the political system in Switzerland, right? So feasibility and, and the ability to potentially get a majority of votes um, is crucial because if, if there is a vote, let's say on, let's say, animal rights, like all, all non-human all non -human animals should, keep, should be granted basic rights. Let's say that's a vote, right? And uh, it's it's shot down by the public and we have like 10% yes votes, whatever. Um, this topic will be politically dead for 15 years. So we really have to be cautious as to what do we put to a vote because then like our, our, when you bring it two years later, people would be like, well, but they shut it down. So we saw that already with discussion about um, an animal lawyer that was also something that was that was started in Switzerland. It was like once uh, a case that was very unique. Um, but uh, yeah, so politically it's very difficult, and we really have to assess where do we want the vote to happen. How progressive should like should it be on a on a cantonal level? Should it be on a national level? And what kind of question do we bring to a vote? So um, yeah, we will have to assess that after the vote at the moment. Can I add something to that as well? Absolutely. Um, so I know that some NGOs are thinking about whether there are options to replicate that for other animals, but not on the cantonal, but on the federal level already. So that's something that's in the cooking, but I can't say more about this also because I don't know more about it. Um, as to things being dead when you get a really low vote, I agree in principle, though I think especially, you know, Swiss people were so peculiar, we, we voted on the CO2 um, uh, Climate Law Act, and we said no to this, we said no to that, et cetera, et cetera. It can't be dead for 10 years, we're going to be in a boiling soup of atmosphere by the time <laughs> so that, um, i grant that exception i grant that exception so that's, yes. so that's changing a bit Silvana, did you, you actually know i think it's so interesting that the grand council which actually said um, we don't have competency to secure basic rights for animals because of the federal competency in that regard said the exact opposite when it comes to establishing a cantonal act for the protection of the climate although the type of federal competency competency is exactly Exactly the same. So you see how much political aspects are playing into this whole legal disputes and legal argumentation. So that's really interesting. I'm a bit more hopeful that we get people to vote on stuff and that we have also by every year that passes, we have better methods to analyze why people said yes or no to a certain manner. So it's not just a yes or no, but you have to evaluate why there's a no. Is this a, a general no to animal rights or is this a no to 
oh, we simply don't know what's going to happen. Um, is it about legal security? Is it about a fear of it expanding to other animals, etc.? So you have means to analyze that. I'm a bit more hopeful in that regard, but nonetheless, I think it's critical that we secure as many yes votes as possible. Yeah, and just to to add for, I know we we often are asked if we are, you know, we currently only represent um, species that have been uh, found to be self-aware um, and are highly cognitively and emotionally complex. So right now, um, our current clients include chimpanzees and elephants and would also extend to all the great apes as well as whales and dolphins. People, you know, will, will cite all these studies, you know, showing that, you know, crows have amazing intellectual abilities or, um, you know, pigs and, and there are so many other species, but um, to be successful, we really have to go with the, the species that people can most um, identify with as, as, you know, being very unique and, and highly cognitively complex. And so that's why we've gone with, this, with the um, species that we've gone with. And I think I agree with Silvano and Charlotte with what you said, um, you know, strategically, you have to sort of start with the most, um, um, you know, uh, strategic um, species to go first. And then, you know, you can determine what type of of rights other species would would you know be best fit for? Yeah, and I'm glad um, all of you kind of touched on this because it kind of feeds into the next question, which is about um, AI and like you know robots and things like that in the future. What are your thoughts on, um, I guess, expanding the definition of non-humans and non-human rights? into that area in the future? I know we get that, that question a lot too at the um, Human Rights Project. Devono, is that something you'd like to cover? <laughs> Absolutely love for you to answer this question if you, if you can. Uh, it's really like, um, no, I, I know that there are, that there are especially in, uh, you know, uh, in the effective altruism movement, there's a big move towards like AI and like, what, what do we have to do? Um, with AI personally, I'm not, I'm really not an expert um, there. Um, so I don't know, Charlotte, if you have anything uh, of value to add to that question. Neither am I when it comes to AI. Um, I think if, if I were to give an intuitive answer, since I'm not an expert in the area, I would say this is something that would, for me, play into the question of which argument um, works in which jurisdiction. So it's a question of cultural environment, right? So you have Saudi Arabia, for example, where I don't know if you've heard that there's a robot called Sophia. If you ever want to watch fun things on the internet, Google uh, Sophia on a date with uh, Will Smith. It's so, it's so interesting. He tries to kind of be romantic with her and she doesn't get it because she's into the robot wit thing. And so, okay, that's really <laughs> But anyway, Sophia <laughs> was given uh, citizenship by Saudi Arabia. And of course, that is going to happen in Saudi Arabia and not, for example, in Switzerland, right? And so um, I'm not entirely sure if she even qualifies as AI or if she qualifies as a robot and what the differentiations are, etc. But apparently in such a jurisdiction, it's... Um, the country is more likely to expand the anthropological barrier, if that is, even is one, to AIs much more than to animals, for example. And some people say that the two are somehow in competition with one another and they talk about which one is going to come forward first in which jurisdiction. Um, yeah, and some say it's going to be really fast once we realize how important um, AIs are and what we're going to be able to do with them. Also, some argue that they're sentient as well, and on this basis should be secured basic rights. And so there's different ways of um, conceptualizing that. As mentioned, I'm not an expert, and I think it doesn't diminish the case for animal rights in any sense. And I... I know nothing about this. So I <laughs> just, I, I'm gonna pass it back to Mickey to ask another question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, Michelle asks, recently I read of a proposal by the European Association of Zoos to cull adult male gorillas due to the overpopulation in zoos. Um, are you aware of this? And can you speak, uh, speak to this issue? Yeah. 
Well, personally, I, I think I have read uh, about this a little bit, but not in depth, to be honest. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm not sure I can give a qualified answer as to what exactly happened, what the reasoning was. Um, yeah, I would need a little bit more context. Sorry. I've also really uh, briefly read about this. Um, of course, that's shocking. It's as shocking as Kalibi, who was killed due to mobbing. Um, however, it is, to my knowledge, an established practice in zoos um, when there's overpopulation or not enough so-called genetic diversity, animals are being killed. And so there was a famous... Um, killing and feeding of a giraffe I think in the Danish zoo a couple of years ago and parts of the giraffe and of course you can see that this was this giraffe because of the, the fur was still on the on the on the body parts etc and he was fed to the lions and everyone was super shocked because they're like he was a young giraffe he was totally healthy and yet you do this obviously for financial reasons, be it financial reasons now or future uh, workings of the zoo. And so that's a common practice. And I think a first step is to actually, I, I think it's fantastic that media are covering these issues also to, to have zoos be confronted with the public's reactions to that. Zoos today are not often obliged to actually be transparent about how many animals they hold, whether they get new ones, what they do with the old ones, who is is who dies, etc. Especially not vis-a-vis -vis the public. So in Switzerland, we had lots of silverbacks that died due to uh, dewarming issues. Which, I mean, it's just even from an from an animal welfare perspective, this is like poor handling, isn't it? It's like the most obvious case of uh, poor animal welfare, and yet that happens, and the zoo is totally um legally protected to be basically silent about this vis-a-vis -vis the public so all the better that we talk about this and so thank you so much for bringing up that point yeah and i think too um again i've only read about this briefly um in in the articles that i've seen recently but i think it also points to or shows that the arguments many zoos make about them keeping animals being for conservation to help species that are imperiled in the wild. It just shows that that's really not the case if they're just culling um, members of an endangered species, either because there isn't enough genetic diversity amongst the breeding population or because they don't have the space or the resources to properly care for them. It just completely shows that the keeping of animals in captivities, especially you know, gorillas, um, elephants, chimpanzees, the only reason for that is for profit. There's no um, conservational value to imprisoning these animals. They merely breed them and hold them captive um, so that they can profit off their mere existence. They're not breeding these animals and sending them back to the wild to help repopulate the wild populations. They're only breeding uh, members of these species to have a new generation of captive uh, gorillas or chimpanzees um, and it, it serves no conservational value and there's, there's no, no excuse for, for what's happening or no legitimate rationalization. So a new strategy that they have is that they somehow whitewash these practices by saying um, that and that amount of uh, percentage of their profits goes to conservation projects abroad, abroad. but it doesn't it doesn't undo the fact that they make their money on the backs of encaged animals who themselves have no rights to social interactions the way that they want to um, bodily movement, moving about, having family relations, having their own family, living in a place um, they of their choosing, etc. So that doesn't change that. And so I think the Non-Human Rights Project homepage is actually a fantastic uh, treasure to to find arguments like these, um, especially also when it comes to the educational value of zoos and the lack thereof, and you know visitors just spending uh, one point something minute at cages and most of the time ridiculing animals rather than actually looking at um, information about these animals and trying to know more about them. And so AIs are, could be interesting in that respect too, or just more broadly digitalization in the sense that we get new tools to inform people about these animals that seem and maybe should be far away from us. 
Um, so I think we have time for one more question. And then at the end, Silvano is going to talk about how you all can support Sentience work on this initiative and help, you know, if you want to support the work they're doing or the work um, to get this initiative passed. Um, so Mickey, I don't know if there's one final question that you'd like to present. Um, yeah, absolutely. Let me, okay. So Leslie um, asks, uh, this is a question for Silvano. For the initiative process, do you do any educational outreach for students? Um, so that's an interesting question. For this initiative specifically, uh, not so much. So what we do at the moment, we do involve uh, youth actually in the process, especially for um, you know handing out flyers. So um, we, we do involve uh, young people in this. They are not the ones that have to vote on the matter, right? You have to be 18 in Switzerland. Uh, nevertheless, of course, it's important to, to educate people that what we're going to be doing, so the real big campaign hasn't started yet, right? So it's gonna start mid-January until mid-February. Um, mid of course, we've already started a bit, but like the really visible campaign uh, that's gonna happen in Basel, it's gonna start then. We're gonna be um, visible all over the city with like big signs and out of home advertising. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna do a big social media campaign where we're gonna target people and also younger people starting from 18, of course, because these are the people that are going to vote. And nevertheless, uh, many activists uh, that we're working with are quite young. And so they're, they're gonna help us reach even the younger population. And in the course of uh, educating the Basel electorate, hopefully we're also gonna be able to educate the younger people that will vote you know, on, the next, on the next initiative that we're gonna propose on fundamental rights, hopefully. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, definitely. Um, that, makes, that makes total sense. And I think it's so important to you empower the youth to get involved in the political process so that they are, um, you know, well-versed in, in the political system and um, advocacy for when they do reach voting age. And so that's great that you have such a strong uh, support from, from younger folks. Um, so if you would like, I know you have um, a flyer slide to show people how um, they can support your work. And then just to let everyone know, um, in a couple hours, once we have the recording, we will send her out an email um, with the links um, to Sentience, um, the, the initiative, if you wanna learn more about it and also ways that you can support the work on this initiative. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so at the moment, I'm just quickly gonna share my slide. Uh, of course, there's a multiple, uh, multiple uh, things that you can do. One of this is um, just talk to people about the initiative, of course. Uh, if you want to have the biggest impact at the moment, um, you can help with a donation. So at the moment, we're really um, planning the out-of-home campaign, our ad campaign. We don't need that. So we calculate that if we get uh, 35,000 signatures in Basel, which is not that many, uh, we're on the safe side. So it's really like not that big of an amount of people that we do need to reach. So the resources also are not massive. So even a small amount really helps us reach those people. Um, so if you want to help, you can you can make a donation. You can help. You can ask your your friends to donate. And um, until the thirty first of uh, December, we're actually going to have a um, like we're going to have a, a generous donor double every donation. So if you give a hundred US dollars, it will auto automatically become two hundred US dollars for us and for the campaign. So that would be uh, at the moment the most useful because, as I said, with even a small amount of money, we'll be able to reach quite a, a lot of relevant people because the, the scope of the initiative is quite small. So um, yeah, so you see the link there, sentience.ch slash en slash donations, um, if you feel like sharing that with anybody. And, and we'll, we'll share that link as well. And if you have any remaining questions for uh, Silvano or Charlotte or myself, even though I'm not involved <laughs> in any way, um, feel free to respond to the email we send out and we'll, we'll forward them on uh, to Silvano and Charlotte so they can answer your questions. And I just wanna thank you both so much for joining us. This is such an amazing initiative and the work that you're doing is so important. Um, and Charlotte, you are amazing the way that you were able to uh, so clearly explain the, uh, the difference between animal welfare and animal rights law in, in um, Switzerland and, and the, the three-year legal dispute was, was, was fantastic. So thank you so much to everyone and um, goodbye. Thank you so much for having us.
All right. Thank you so much. Right.